Tonight I want us to do a little bit of a review, uh, keep it kind of simple, but we'll see. I, I, sometimes I get stuck in the, in the weeds a little bit, but I want us to, to review something that I'm sure, I know that we all know, that we've all heard, because it's something that we discuss every time that we come together. Uh, every time that I stand here, every time that we offer the invitation, uh, we discuss the five steps of salvation. Whether we call it that or not, we've discussed those things. And if you grew up in the church, I know you've heard of those five steps. And, and even if you started attending worship as an adult, you've likely heard it phrased in that way. What I know you've heard is that in order to become a Christian, the Bible teaches that a person needs to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And we might say that sequence of events or milestones... Uh, we might say that often, we might remember them easily, and they might even roll off our tongue because we've heard them so many times. Uh, there is not one single passage in the Bible that contains all five of those steps, not explicitly. Now, when we see someone uh, baptized in the book of Acts, for example, all of those things have taken place. But there is not one passage in God's Word that contains all of those five steps explicitly spelled out but God's word in different passages requires each and every one of those things to happen in order for a person to be saved. And each of those steps is essential, and not a single step can be skipped. And really, pretty much, they need to go in the order that we say them. It's kind of a man-made uh, order or a man-made device that we use to remember that and to teach that, but it is absolutely biblical. A person cannot be baptized without believing, without confessing, without repenting of sin. If they are baptized without even repenting of sin, they haven't been baptized at all. They have just gotten wet. They've just gone down into the baptistry. A person cannot confess in an effort to lead to their salvation, confess the name of Jesus before men without first hearing or believing the word of God. What would they confess if they didn't know that Jesus was God's son, uh, learning it from God's word? A person cannot believe, of course, without hearing, which is the very first step in becoming a Christian. Every person needs to hear the gospel. In Acts chapter 2, the crowd, the multitude of people, heard as Peter and likely the other apostles preached that first gospel sermon, and they responded, what shall we do? They heard what Peter was saying. Uh, they applied that in their life. They said, what shall we do? In Acts chapter 8, Philip uh, joins that, uh, the chariot of that Ethiopian man, that Ethiopian eunuch. He explains the scripture to him. He preaches Jesus to him. That eunuch hears what he says. He says, Ultimately, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? He has heard the word of God. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison, and those doors are opened miraculously by God. That, that prison guard is determined to kill himself, for surely one of these prisoners at least has escaped. And then they preach the gospel message to that jailer. All of those people in his house heard that message and he asked, what must I do? Christians are commanded, we are commanded to go out into the world and preach that gospel. Mark chapter, or Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach to all creation. Uh, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who disbelieves, New American Standard says, shall be condemned. And we do that, we preach God's word, not just because we want to obey God's commands, though we need to. We do it because if we don't, then others who do not know God and others uh, who do not know the things that we know about God will not hear the gospel message. If we don't take the gospel to the world around us, the, the world around us will not hear the gospel. And if they don't hear the gospel, how could they ever believe or repent or confess or ultimately, of course, as Many, if not most, or if not all of us, have been baptized. And I know that we're familiar with these five steps of salvation. Again, we run through them really every invitation that is offered. 
And maybe we've heard them all our life, and maybe we have them written down in the inside cover of our Bible so they are ready at hand. That's what I've always had them written down. I think since like third grade, I've had them written in my Bible. I like to write in my Bible. I think it's mine, and I'm never going to let anyone use it anyway. So uh, I always have them written down in my Bible with a little scripture reference. Maybe they are just in the bulletin that we pick up every Sunday, which, by the way, they are. They always are, ready for anyone to read or, or pick up and read those things and study those uh, throughout the week. But tonight, I want us to take a little bit of a closer look. And specifically, I want us to start tonight by, by talking about, by considering those first two steps in God's perfect plan of salvation, hearing and believing when I was in college at Freed Hardeman 25 years ago or so, I went home one summer uh, with the intent of working for my father. My dad was always, or preached as I was growing up, and I know I've mentioned that, but he always had a secular job as well. Uh, he told me that one day he looked at me and saw how crooked my teeth were and decided he needed to earn some money. And so he started a business, and he always sold uh, nuts and bolts and industrial chemicals is what we said. He had a very small sales business, and he would go around to school districts and hospitals and, and uh, cities and go to their maintenance departments and sell them nuts and bolts or whatever chemical or a tube of grease and, and stuff, stuff like that. And he was busy, and that business did pretty well, I guess. And when I was in college, I learned that I could go home and work for him for a summer and earn three hours of college credit. It would be an internship, and I'd have to write a little paper. And so that's what I was going to do. I was going to go home and learn how to sell chemicals from my dad. It was a terrible, terrible fit. I am a terrible salesman. Uh, I know we have some salesmen among us. I am not a salesman, at least not of chemicals, not of nuts and bolts. Uh, I could sell you a hamburger, and, and I would enjoy it, and then I'd have one next to you. But what I was tasked to do with my dad watching was sell things that I didn't care about at all. I didn't understand them. I didn't uh, love chemicals. I, didn't, uh, I thought they were funny. He sold a, a cleaner that was used for washing pigs at hog farms or whatever. And he got to name whatever his chemicals were named. And so that was called hogwash. And... Uh, I didn't know a lot about hogwash, not enough to convince someone that they needed a tube of hogwash. And, and so I, I did very poorly at that. I didn't believe in it. I didn't understand it. I didn't appreciate it. I wasn't trained in it, uh, in the things that I was selling. In a very respectful way, I want to say this respectfully. We are all salesmen of the gospel. And again, I say that very respectfully. I'm not trying to belittle uh, our role or redefine our role, but in a sense we are salesmen when it comes to the gospel message. We are not only charged with sharing the gospel with everyone that is around us, but we attempt to do that in a way that is most effective. We want people to realize that this is what they need in their lives, that this is what they need for their eternal salvation. We want people to be so convicted by the message that we share, however we can get that in their ears and in their hearts, that they are going to be willing to do what we've done, maybe even turn their life completely upside down in order to obey God's word. Our goal is always that someone will hear and believe and repent, and confess, and be baptized for the remission of their sins. And I don't think we can do that most effectively, I guess, if we don't love and understand and appreciate and believe exactly what we are respectfully selling. And I hope we understand what I'm saying. What we're trying to convince people that they need, that we know they need. And so tonight, let's consider hearing and believing very briefly, or a very light treatment, I guess we could say. Uh, hearing and believing both require teaching. Turn in your Bibles, if you'd like to follow along, to Romans chapter 10. We'll look at three passages tonight. Romans chapter 10. Hearing and believing both require teaching. And maybe this sounds obvious, but perhaps we should consider it a bit more. Hearing the word of God and believing the word of God, and again, that's 
what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to get all the way, in fact, to that last step of baptism when we share the gospel with those who are around us. But hearing and coming to believe in the word of God absolutely always requires someone to teach the word of God. And that might be one of the most forgotten or overlooked principles of the New Testament. Perhaps, uh, you know, people uh, aren't going to uh, believe in God's word, uh, or we think they're not going to believe in God's word, but we don't know that until we teach it. And in fact, it's not our job to force them to believe in God's word. It is our job to teach God's word. But there is zero chance that people are going to come to a knowledge of God's word or his perfect plan of salvation if we as Christians, the body of Christ, don't teach it. By God's perfect design, and his church is perfect, his gospel is perfect, his plan of salvation is absolutely perfect, by God's perfect design, church members, you and I, are workers in his kingdom. And as workers in his kingdom, we have a job to do. We have been charged to preach and teach the gospel to others. And again, if we don't do that, we can be sure of one thing. We can be perfectly sure that no one else will. What if the crowd didn't hear Peter preach on Acts chapter 2 because Peter said, well, they probably already know. Or what if in Acts chapter 8, that Philippian jailer, you know, Paul and Silas said, well, he, he, you know, he's a Gentile. He probably doesn't want to hear. Or what if, excuse me, that's Acts 16, in Acts chapter 8 with that uh, Ethiopian eunuch, what if Philip said, I don't want to talk to that guy, I don't want to run through the, the, down the dusty road to catch up to him, and he never shared the gospel with him. What would have happened to those people? I know they certainly never would have come to believe. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13, Paul writes, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And when we see that call on the name of the Lord, we can take all of the text that God has given us, and we know that calling on the name isn't just saying the, the Lord's name. It is more than that. It is obeying God's word. It is embracing all of God's commands. Whoever will embrace all of God's commands, whoever will call on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How can a person call on the name of the Lord if they don't believe in the Lord? They can't. How can a person believe in the Lord if they have never heard of the Lord? They simply can't. And we can take it farther. How can a person know about baptism or repentance or confession if they've never been taught about baptism or repentance or confession. And I think sometimes as Christians, we know it is our job to share the gospel. I know it's this way for me sometimes. But we might say, well, I'm pretty sure they know. We live in a religious community. There are more churches in this town than I've ever seen in any town I've ever lived in. Uh, maybe because we're near Main Street. But there's a, a church on every corner. There are so many red brick church buildings in Davie County, it boggles my mind. And I think we grew up with these people sometimes, and we might think, well, they've always gone to that church. Their family's always gone to that church. They already know what they believe. Or sometimes we think, you know, I don't want to talk to that person because they're probably, and we, we raise them or elevate them to this uh, level of some religious scholar who is going to shoot down everything we try to teach them with some sophisticated argument. I don't think that's the way it is. I think it's our job to share the gospel with people. I think... Believing the truth of the gospel requires hearing the truth of the gospel. And I don't think we should assume that everyone in the world has heard the truth of the gospel. What if so-and-so who's gone there all their lives has never heard that baptism is for the remission of their sins, Acts 2.38? Or what if they have never heard that you should get up and have your sins washed away, Acts 22.16? Or they've never heard that baptism now saves you, 1 Peter 3.21, because it has never been preached in that building? I don't know. What if they've never heard it? You and I are the ones, the preachers, who have to allow them to, to, to preach the gospel so that they can hear, so that they can believe. Hearing and believing both require teaching. Second, hearing and believing both require thought and understanding. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. 
They both require thought and understanding. When we say, hear the word of God in that first step of this plan of salvation, if you will. When we say, hear the word of God. Oh, excuse me. Man, my throat is terrible. I'm, I really apologize. When we say, hear the word of God, we don't mean just sound waves from someone's voice standing in a pulpit or reading scripture or delivering some message that will pass across someone's ears. Hearing the word of God in a way that that leads them to the ultimate goal of baptism and eternal salvation is surely much more than that. It is a hearing that must lead to believing. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the words of Christ or hearing the word of God. Faith that comes by hearing, that comes after hearing, that comes from that hearing is a belief or a trust in God. That belief, that trust comes from hearing, digesting, understanding what is being taught. It's a hearing that requires thought. Uh, In order to be saved, a person needs to consider the things that they hear. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 10, Luke is writing about those Bereans that we're familiar with, that they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Why is it that they were more noble-minded? For they received the word with great eagerness. They were excited about hearing a message from God's word and then examining the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were so. They were noble-minded more than the Thessalonians because they were excited about God's word. And once they got a hold of it, received it, not just let it pass across their eardrums. Once they got a hold of it, they searched the scriptures every single day to find out whether or not those things were so. They put what they heard to the test in order or in hopes of getting a better understanding. It's a hearing that requires our thought, and it's a hearing that requires our understanding. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is explaining to his disciples the parable of the sower. And we remember the parable. There are those four types of soils. Those four soils represent four different hearts that would receive or hear, we could say, the gospel, uh, representing four kinds of people, maybe in four different circumstances of life or, or four different willingnesses to obey God's word. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 19, he's explaining what it all means. And he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the the seed was sown beside the road. There's no depth there. It doesn't take hold. They don't understand it. They've heard it. It has passed across their eardrums. Uh, They have been taught the gospel, but they haven't fully received it. And Jesus is saying that they are as susceptible as ever of the evil one coming And snatching away that truth. If we hear the most beautiful sermon that has ever been preached, it won't be here. Uh, If we hear the most beautiful sermon that has ever been preached, imagine it is on the perfect sound system. It is the perfect length of time. Everything is technically perfect about it. Three three points, a poem, everything. It, it, It finishes Not too early and not too late. Your attention is is kept throughout the entire thing. Maybe this preacher, his beautiful voice, uses an illustration that just hits you right in your heart. Or he quotes your favorite scripture. Better yet, he quotes your late mother's favorite scripture. He touches you emotionally. You're so excited about this sermon. If we hear that sermon, but we don't come to an understanding of what God requires of us. If we don't, through hearing even a sermon like that, understand what God's plan of salvation requires and ends or requires ultimately uh, in baptism for the remission of our sins, that sermon, as beautiful as it is, hasn't done us any good. And again, Jesus might say we are just as vulnerable of having that evil one come and snatch that truth away. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10, Jesus says to the crowd, hear and understand. Listen to what I am saying. Listen to what I'm teaching you and come to an understanding 
of what I'm teaching you. Hearing and believing both involve our thought and understanding. And third, hearing and believing require open and loving hearts. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. Hearing and believing both require open and loving hearts. As Christians, we have to love the world enough to share the gospel with the world around us. And again, maybe this is one of those obvious things, but it is still absolutely true. I, I believe, I know that at North Main we are a loving group. Everything that I've seen tells me that we are. But we not only love each other, and I can tell that in the way that we interact and the things that we do for one another, the way we worship together, but I believe that we love those who are in the world who do not yet know God just as much. I have never heard a comment from anyone in this building otherwise. I think we have a respect and a love for those uh, who are all around us but who do not yet know God's gospel plan of salvation. And I'm thankful that we have that kind of love because we need that kind of love to share the gospel with the world. Uh, those who hear the word also need to have a heart that is willing to receive it. I think one of the most frustrating and difficult things to accept for many people, and, and for myself included, especially when you go out and you begin to study with the Bible with those uh, who you know well, uh, who, with maybe your family members or your neighbors or your, your co-workers, maybe people that you have known for years, one of the things that I have been very frustrated with and have struggled with myself is that you can't force anyone to obey the gospel. You just can't do it. You can't force anyone to open their heart. You can get someone so close to understanding what the Bible says about salvation, they can repeat it back to you and, and tell you they understand it, and you think, well, let's go get in that baptistry and get it done. Have your sins washed away. Uh, why do you wait? Why tarriest thou, as King James says? Uh, get up, uh, be baptized, and have those sins washed away, and yet you can't force anyone to do that. And you don't want to force anyone to do that. You want that to be their decision. You want them to grow into believing what they have heard. Hearing and believing God's word requires, absolutely requires, an open heart. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 14, the Bible says afterwards, speaking of Jesus, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he has risen. Even the closest disciples of Jesus failed to open their hearts. He, he rebuked them, New King James says, for the hardness of their hearts when it came to the good news of the gospel. Those closest disciples, those 11 men who had been with him for years would not believe others who were telling them Jesus has risen from the grave. People were coming and saying, He is risen. The tomb is empty. The, the stone was rolled away. We looked inside. He wasn't there. I turned around, and there He was speaking to me in the garden. And the Bible says, Jesus says, all 11 of those men who became apostles refused to believe. We often... Think of poor Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas. That's what we talk about. That's, that's what we read. Poor Thomas was isolated. In John chapter 20, the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. And Thomas is famous for saying, Unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand in the side, I will not believe. But it wasn't just Thomas. It was also doubting Peter and doubting Andrew, and doubting James, and doubting John, and so on, and so on, and so on. They all had trouble believing that this was truly happening, that Jesus had truly been risen. And in Mark chapter 16, Jesus reproaches, or Jesus rebukes all of them, not just Thomas, all of those 11 apostles who heard that good news, but whose hearts were not open. And again, these are his closest disciples. They have heard him preach and teach personally for years Jesus has explained what is going to happen for weeks and weeks building up to this moment and Jesus says not only do you need to believe that these things have actually taken place now I need you to go out into the world 
and share it with everyone else. I want to make sure that you understand what has happened. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, he continues, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Hearing and believing the word of God. Both of those things require open and loving hearts. We as Christians need to love the lost enough to go out into the world and share the gospel message. And those who hear the word of God preached need to have hearts open to receiving it. It is absolutely essential for a person to hear and to believe the word of God in order to have eternal salvation from sin. In John chapter 5, Jesus says, He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Hearing and believing, they both require us to teach. Hearing and believing both require thought and understanding. Hearing and believing, they both require open and loving hearts. And in the coming weeks, I want us to talk a little bit more about this. But our job as Christians is to teach God's word. It is to trust that God will give the increase. And it is to absolutely share the gospel with the world that is around us. Next Sunday, I want to continue this refresher. And again, I know these things are familiar to us, but I hope that it's helpful by thinking a little bit more about the next two steps, at least, repenting and confessing. What exactly does that mean? I think there might be at times a little confusion, or we might not always be so equipped to explain those things to someone who might ask, and so uh, we'll look at those a little closer next week. Uh, tonight, as we close, we offer the invitation to anyone who might need to respond. Uh, we've talked about it already, but let's talk about it again. If you have heard the Word of God and you believe it with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, if you're willing to confess the name of Jesus before men and go down and repent of sin in your life, excuse me, you can then go down into the waters of baptism, and the Bible teaches that you come out of those waters to walk in a newness of life. When you come up out of that water, your sin has been washed away. You have become a child of God. You have become a Christian in that moment. You are no longer separated from God, but drawn near by the blood of Christ. If you haven't done that, we would invite you to make that decision tonight. Maybe you have been baptized, but you have sin in your life, and maybe that sin is public in nature and would demand a public repentance. If that's the case, we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We don't want you to leave this place carrying that burden of sin and separation from God. Or maybe you just have trials in this life, struggles in this life. Maybe spiritual discouragement is right around the corner and you would benefit from the prayers of this congregation while we're gathered here tonight. If that is the case, or if there is any reason that we can help you tonight, Please make it known. Come forward now while we stand, while we sing this invitation song.